Good morning, Reggie. Good morning, Chance. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a bit cold this morning, and there is a considerable amount more bird song than there was last week. I don't know what's going on, but it's distinctively noticeable. Which is a good sign. Good morning, dear. How the devil are you? Are the dogs going to scare him off? What a wonderful sight we happened upon. I'll tell you what, it's one of the coldest mornings we've been out for for a long time. And that fella's definitely interested in us, isn't he? We're not too close, though. Probably, yeah, a couple of hundred metres away. Off he goes. Bouncing along. Well, that's made my day. Two great things, actually, this morning. The colour of that sun. The camera doesn't do it justice. It really is red. Deep orange. At worst. Or at best. And then a lovely day this morning. Oh, I think today is going to be a good day. And we're brewing beer. For your eyes. Well, it's absolutely flat calm today. This is the calmest I've seen it this year, I think, actually. I, I, with the amount of times I've been out. Looks bloody lovely. That means there's not a breath of wind in the air, of course. So I just thought I'd grab a snap of that. I'm off over there. I don't know if you can see it. Just in the middle of the shot now. There's a little coffee hut. He's not open, but he's got a dog poop in. You know, for the essentials. Every morning, what you want to see is Reggie and Chance's poo in a frigging bag. That's how we roll. Oh, good morning, folks. Well, we're in work now, and uh, I must apologise before we go any further. I've actually done some welding and a uh, little bit of bodging, and I didn't bring you along for the ride. Um, and that's led me to want to dismantle and repair this Dremel tool that I bought, and I only got a few hours' worth of work out of it before its function became intermittent. So I've had a little disc on the front here and I've been cutting into a spray ball and unfortunately this keeps like bouncing up and down with its speed you know you're meant to be able to set it to so many thousand rpm with this little dial here and sometimes it gets to a stage where it just stops and you kind of bang it on the floor and swing it around your head like a microphone on a wire and it comes back on again briefly for a minute or two. And then off it goes again. So we've got that in pieces to have a look at it and see if we can figure out exactly what's going on. But what have I been doing with it? Well, the reason I've got the camera out now is because Gemma's made me half a litre of tea in this giant DigiKey mug. I don't know whether I can consume half a litre of tea. It must be par for the course where Andy works. Thanks for the tea, Gem. Okay, okay. So what we've been doing and we do have a brew on, is manipulating the spray balls. So when you buy these particular spray balls from eBay, they're readily available on eBay and Amazon, they come with many, many slots and holes under the impression that you're going to have a pump there that's going to kind of move uh, something like one million gallons per second. Well doesn't happen. Those lights are flickering for us a little bit as well now I'm in the sunlight. How about if I turn around this way? There we go. Still see a reflection of it. Anyway, let's continue. So, two or three slots on the side, slots on the edge, in order for them to spray in all directions and have the power like that jets out this way and if you rotate it 180 degrees, so does that. So these are spraying out pushing back, equal and opposite force and all that kind of jazz makes the spray ball rotate. Yeah, it's simple. Too many holes is the, is the issue. So I've welded a lot of them up 
and the holes are in different places depending on what we want to do with the actual spray ball. These, I've got two of these which are for these tanks and then we've got three of these spray balls on the cask washer. Now the ones on the cask washer have a different spray pattern because I don't need as much liquid jetting down and if it was in a cask washer that would be down but in the tank that is up. So with the tank we want stuff spraying up to hit the top of the tank walls and in the cask washer we want stuff spraying down. We don't want stuff spraying down, we want it spraying up as well but because the whole assembly is inverted the holes need to be on the other side so there's like a couple of holes up at the top and then one or two at the side again to give it that rotary spray so all I've been doing basically is using the Dremel with a real fine little cutting disc to kind of cut this slot out now it's bigger than one uh, it's not as big as the one mil slitting discs I've got for the grinder so I can't use those and the Dremel ones are still a little bit big too. Ideally we want about half a millimetre. But they're less than one mil, so they work. And of course, if the Dremel's not working, it's really difficult. I did start doing these with a hacksaw. You know, forget it. I'm not doing it with a hacksaw. It was like I was trying to break out of jail, cutting through stainless steel with a hacksaw. And like the stroke length on it as well was ridiculously short. I would have been there a month or Sundays, I'm sure of it. So if we come back here, yeah, I'm just about to remove all of the components from the clamshell, hopefully without losing too much to the floor and I have a feeling that it may be an issue with either a contact, I can see we've got the mains coming in here, the brushes which are in here, or maybe something on the stator, I don't know. But we'll explore anyway. And for those of you who are interested, what are we brewing today? It is the proof of concept. It's the first time we've used the new control panel in anger. We set it up this morning and the HLT temperature worked absolutely perfectly. No worries at all there. In fact everything's worked really well so far. Only thing I've not had on is the boil elements and uh, the mash pump didn't work because for some reason I put the cable in the wrong connector. I put it in the boil pump connector so I suppose if I had turned the boil pump on it would have worked but uh, yeah I didn't think about that it works anyway so let's just have a look how how full the mash tun actually uh, the boil kettle actually is and that'll let us know if we can uh, we can't yet unfortunately we can't yet put the elements on because they're still exposed but we can come back in 10 minutes and have a look then but other than that Working seamlessly, really impressed with it. Right, let me go and pull this Dremel body out of its uh, out of its housing, and I'll see if I can diagnose the problem. I'm not 100% sure, but I think I may have narrowed it down to one connection. Strangely enough, this little circuit board had this brown tape wrapped around this edge, like so. I mean, why, why is that on there, if it's come from the factory like that? I don't know, maybe it's just to protect any rogue swarf or anything getting in there. I don't know, but this is the controlling section. This is the brain box of the whole shebang. This is basically just a potentiometer. I've measured it. It goes from 0 0.4 ohms all the way up to something like 6 or 10 kilo ohms. So that seems to be functioning alright. And then between this connector here, which connects directly into one end of the stator windings, and this connector here, we have a reading of several mega ohms. And I think that may be something to do with 
what's happening. It's not a hall sensor because that sits next to where the bushes rub on the rotor like that and then the bush holder sits on top of it like that and it does touch it but it doesn't touch it with it's not soldered but it's almost close enough to be making an electrical connection but not if you know what I mean so because we're having some intermittent buzzing and jumping I wonder if that's something to do with it maybe that should have been tack welded to the bottom of the bush holder or something like that I don't know do you know I don't know either way when I put it back together I'm gonna focus on making sure that those two components get a connection because there was nothing in between them both so I'm gonna reassemble that and see how we get on Pleased to say that problem's cured, but we have another one. Unfortunately, the thermo probe for the boil, which is coupled to this West 6100 Plus, is playing silly buggers. So I've got him hanging out here. I've tried several things earthing the shielding, uh, what we are, 88 degrees. So I'm measuring it manually at the moment, but if we look at the probe temp, you see it says 18.2 on there. This is just bare metal and um, it's not earthed at the other end. Let's just stick him in. There we go. It's got a little bit of heat paste on it. It runs all the way up to a specific temp. Remember we're at 80. So it does want to get up to 80 and then all of a sudden it'll peak up up at like 60 something and then down she tumbles. So why is it doing that? Why is it falling all the way down now? I've not got a clue as to what's going on there. But we've got it on manual mode so we'll keep it there. And I think what I'm going to do ultimately is just switch it out and we'll put a, an ink bird in there. We know where we stand with the ink birds. They're a little bit less complex, so therefore are easier to uh, easier to run. So this one's going to go in the maybe use another day bucket. But I think the issue is having the probes connect up to it and the right uh, whether it's a PT100 or K type thermocouple or whatever. And I'm in the middle of a brew day, so I simply don't have the time to do any diagnosis at the minute. We'll just run it as it is and brew manually. I know where we want to be. We get to about 100 degrees and then we just knock it down to 40, 45% and we should be, should be cooking. So what I want to do really is pull that back out and then it will reset itself again it's a very strange and we'll get this probe and we'll pop that back in there and there we are we can now read the temperature off manually and just work from there we can get round it here we go look at that now now it's dropping right down into the minus and it definitely isn't that cold in here Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Righto. Well, testing this side. Can't go any further with her. Got the old shebang in the box. And, uh, you know, I've just decided to pull this old West P6100 out because it was also starting to show those transient spikes again and I just didn't like the look of it. I put the pump on and I could see that the light was blinking on the board and I had a quick search online and one of the biggest 
most obvious things that came to the front of my mind whilst doing that was on a on a on a post where people were explaining um signal variations that which I seen on like PT one hundreds and PIDs. They said don't rule out a dodgy piece of equipment. Your PID could be no good. So I don't know its history. I've had it for well uh two thousand and seventeen I've had it for five years, it could have been ten years old before then. So, we're changing it out for an Inkbird. Unfortunately, this is an Inkbird ITC 100 um, VL. So it outputs a voltage. Now that voltage is not enough to run an indicator light and two solid state relays. It doesn't put out enough ampage enough current. I prefer the RL models, relay models with the low voltage so the 12 volt hook up on the panel and you just run your 12 volts through them so you can have a big beefy 12 volt power supply in the panel itself and then you can run that through here and it's got the power to light all the indicator lamps on the panel without any issues whatsoever. So in the meantime I've put in the um what's it called vl and as you can see it's reading the temperature quite well i stole the probe from this one here i've lost a probe for some reason i don't know where where the pt 100's gone so we're just waiting for an rl to arrive and we'll swap that out and then all this will work perfectly no problems just like the hlt does you see turn the hlt off the light turns off doesn't work so obvious with this one because anyway wiring and ting so we're just gonna put this into auto on mode and we'll leave this sat overnight and we'll pick up tomorrow where we will be brewing vacant gesture for the next three days back to back sounds fun doesn't it trust me it kind of loses its polish a touch. I'd like to be brewing something new. I know that. Oh, so before I go, I'll set up a timer on the boil pump so it can recirculate the caustic through there. We'll use this little thing here. All I do is just turn it round until it says hello. Like that. And then it's run. It's going to run for an hour or so. And uh, yeah, we'll do it that way. How do you like them apples? In fact, while you're here, well, let's have a look. I know I like doing this. It shows you the caustic pulling all of the uh, staining, I guess you like, out of the quite chill so let's do that there we go liquids cleared up just change the valve -age. and there we go there's the colour change coming in now No, that wasn't too bad today. Normally it's considerably darker than that. That was a light green. That means soiling isn't that bad. Just give that a little bit of a purge. And then we're going to leave it running through the plate chiller. And a little bit through there. And that's a, that's a good one, boys and girls. So I'm going to go home. And I'm going to have a pint of best bitter and you know I've been watching uh, Richard or Tricky over at Dudes Brews quite a bit recently and uh, yeah did a number on five points bitter and uh, that kind of stuff and it really gave me yeah gave me a taste for a bit of best so I've actually ordered some five points 
can't get it anywhere in the supermarkets where you used to be able to actually around here. I know Sainsbury's were carrying it at one point. Well, yeah, I've had to order it from the brewery, which is no bad thing. So I've got a mixed pack while I was there. Anyway, that's it. I'm off home and we'll catch you on the next one, boys and girls. Freaking right you will. Cheers.